Hello, everyone. Thank you for dialing in and participating to this webinar today on a practical guide to climate disclosures. Uh, my name is Nancy Meyer, and I'm the Director of Corporate Engagement here at C2ES, and I'm pleased to be hosting this conversation with you today. We had over 375 folks register, so you know there is a lot of interest in understanding how the climate reporting landscape is changing and what resources are available to companies wishing to analyze and disclose their climate-related risks and opportunities. And so I'm very pleased to be hosting this discussion with two experts in the space from the Climate Disclosure Standards Board and the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. But before we dive into the content of the webinar today, I wanted to take care of just a few housekeeping items. First, I wanted to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on uh, the C2ES YouTube page following the broadcast. Um, and it can also be found via our website on our events page. Um, and then secondly, because there are so many participants, we're going to be using the GoToWebinar chat box for questions. Um, you can typically find that chat function on the right-hand side of your webinar screen. And feel free to just submit questions at any time, and then I'll raise them for our panelists during the discussion. So with that, um, let's move to um, giving you a roadmap to what we're going to cover today. So I'm going to kick things off with a brief introduction and some more information about C2ES, and then I'll lead into some background about the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD, um, which has been central to getting more companies and organi organizations engaged on the topic of climate disclosure. And then I'll also provide a short overview of some of our work at C2ES in this space. Um, after that, we'll uh, ha lead into our expert presentations from Nadine Robinson at CDSB and David Parham at SASB. And so most of the Q&A will stay for the end of the presentations, but if there are specific questions raised uh, toward either panelist, I might raise them sooner. But we'll definitely have plenty of time to cover Q&A at the end. So again, just uh, remember to submit your questions in that chat box chat box as they come up. So with that, um, let me switch uh, to saying a few words about C2ES. So C2ES is an independent and nonpartisan nonprofit organization focused on strong policy and action to addressing climate change. Uh, core to our mission is forging practical solutions to reduce GHG emissions, expand clean energy, and strengthen resilience to climate impacts. Uh, we are also well known as a convener of stakeholders, and so that means federal, state, local governments, as well as corporations and other NGOs, and we produce um, a wide variety of publications on topics that range from carbon pricing to climate resilience strategies to international climate negotiations with COP coming up. And speaking of our research, uh, I just want to hi highly encourage you to check out our website. You can find um, some of our reports on our library, upcoming events both uh, recorded events like this, so our uh, webinars, as well as live events. Uh, we have a blog and some other great reference material that you can check out there. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to mention one of the unique features um, of our organization is that we have a Business Environmental Leadership Council, and my role here at C2ES is to work directly with our business council. And um, as you can see on the slide here, we have lots of top companies um, from the electric power sector, manufacturing, transportation, high tech, oil, gas, and finance sectors. So this is one of the largest US-based groups of companies devoted solely to addressing climate change. And um, one of the key benefits of our, of our BELC is that it's, um, that's the, the acronym BELC for Business Environmental Leadership Council, is that it's um, multi-sectoral. Um, and so unlike a trade association, companies can talk to other companies outside of their industry on climate policy and climate strategy. Um, and a lot of the stakeholder work that we do involves engaging this particular group of companies with others that are trying to move the needle on climate action. So with that, um, let's kind of switch gears and dive into the topic of today's discussion. As I mentioned, the topic of climate disclosure um, is not new, even though TCFD is relatively new, but um, it was announced, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures at COP21 in Paris. And since then, this issue has definitely taken much more of a center stage. Um, the TCFD Working Group actually reports to the Financial Stability Board, or the FSB, which it reports to the G20, and its aim is to, to strengthen the financial system and the stability of international financial markets. So with that in mind, um, the overarching goal of creating this task force, um, or the TCFD, was to develop a framework that allows more companies 
companies rather to disclose their climate related risk in a way that allows financial markets to price that risk and make better informed capital allocation decisions. Uh, and the recommendations that TCFD came out with were published actually a year and a half ago. They came out in June 2017. And, and just kind of a, a quick hit on what those were, um, they were directed at all organizations with public debt or equity and encouraged those organizations to put their disclosures into their mainstream financial filings. Um, they also asked that companies follow a specific framework. And so you can see on the slide here that there are four key areas that this framework covers, um, those elements being governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. And I'm not going to dive into the specifics of all of those recommendations here. Uh, the speakers are going to touch on it a bit. You can also go to the TCFD's website and download the report to get more information about the recommendations themselves. But I did want to... Um, set the stage with this overall picture. Um, with that in mind, I also wanted to mention that uh, when TCFD issued these recommendations, they did so with the expectation that they would be implemented over the course of the next five years. And so now we're a year and a half in, we're almost you know, a quarter, a third of the way down the road on that timeline. Um, it's a great time to check in with groups like CDSB and SASB are helping to develop tools that allow companies to work toward full implementation of these recommendations. Um, that being said, uh, C2ES has also been hard at work in the space of helping companies to kind of wrap their hands around these recommendations. So I just wanted to take a moment to highlight what we've been doing um, in this space for the last couple of years. So our first report, which you can see up here on the screen, came out last September and just highlighted some of our key takeaways from the TCFD final recommendations. Um, and that included finding that the TCFD framework was very flexible and allowing companies to be more transparent. Um, in, in discussing their climate-related risks and opportunities. Um, we also found that um, regardless of where regulatory action goes in this space, that companies are going to be faced with answering requests for this type of information more and more, so it makes sense for companies to try to get ahead of this. And then lastly, that there's um, still a lot of work to do to enable better reporting of this information and that, you know, these TCFD recommendations were very comprehensive, but they require a lot of work and internal analysis on behalf of companies. And so it's going to take time for those organizations to gather the resources and get um, kind of everything lined up to, to make sense uh, or to really follow what the TCFD was trying to um, accomplish. So... Um, with that, one of those areas that we found in that earlier report was that companies needed more guidance, particularly around that recommendation that companies should use scenario analysis to inform um, some of their strategy discussions. And so over the past year, we organized a series of webinars and roundtable discussions here at C2ES to discuss how companies can get started on using those scenarios to better assess their climate-related risks and opportunities. And then we published this report that you see here um, in August that highlighted some of our key takeaways from those dialogues. Uh, and some of those key takeaways included that companies should consider using publicly available scenarios um, and just fine tune them to explore some company specific risks. We also discussed that, you know, this, the scenarios exercises aren't supposed to be predictive or exhaustive, that um, they should just focus on those variables that could have material impact on their business. Um, we also uh, discussed how a range of scenarios should be used when conducting this type of analysis to illustrate financial resilience under a variety of climate-related outcomes that could affect um, any aspect of your value, value chain. And then lastly, that these exercises should, should be done regularly, um, but doesn't necessarily mean repeating an entire scenarios exercise, but rather monitoring signposts and those sorts of things can, can be useful ways to not have to do such a labor-intensive exercise like scenarios. Um, but that's just a few of the key points. Again, you can download this and our other report um, from our website to get more information. Um, and then lastly, just looking forward, we do plan to continue our work in 2019 uh, on TCFD-related topics. Um, that includes helping companies work through how they look at some of the, the big macro scenarios and pull out company or sector related um, impacts that they can then use for this type of analysis. And then secondly, we're also going to be looking at um, the physical risks of climate change and how that can um, impact companies. Um, so with that, I am very pleased to introduce our two speakers that we have with us today. 
Um, we're going to hear first from Nadine Robinson, who is the Technical Director at the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, or CDSP. Uh, Nadine leads and delivers their International Technical Work Program and manages the Secretariat for its Technical Working Group. Um, TCFD is one of her key focus areas. Um, specifically, she focuses on making corporate reporting fit for purpose. So exactly who we want to hear from today. And then secondly, um, we have David Parham, from, uh, who is the Deputy Director of Research at the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, or SASB. And David is responsible for supporting and providing technical oversight for the SASB research team, and that includes identifying um, and researching financially material and industry-specific sustainability risks and opportunities. Um, so with that, um, that's just a very brief overview of our speakers, but I'm more than pleased to introduce Nadine and pass the baton to her to tell us a bit more about what they've been doing and working on at CDSB. Nadine? Thank, thank you, Nancy. I'm delighted to be here and to join uh, join C2ES and SASB in this webinar on a practical guide, guide to climate disclosures. Obviously, this is something at the heart of CDSB's work. Um, the structure of, of my the, my talk for the next 20 minutes is, is is fivefold. Basically, I'm going to start with an introduction to, uh, to tell you a little bit about the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. Then um, I'm going to introduce our CDSB framework and um, to explain how um, our frame, framework aligns with the TCFD. I will then have um, some comments on how SASB, CDSB, and, and TCFD fit together. And I will conclude um, my talk with some, um, signposting to some further guidance and support specifically for those uh, preparers looking at how to embark on their um, TCFD disclosures. So if I begin with an introduction to the Climate D Disclosure Standards Board. So we are an international consortium of nine environmental and business NGOs, and we were set up in 2007 in Davos at the World Economic Forum. Our members include CDP, CERES, AITA, the Climate Group, and a number of um, other organizations which should be listed on the bottom of the slide there, SASB, WBCSD, the World Resources Institute, and the World Economic Forum. Now, SASB was, um, joined our board in um, late 2016 as our newest member, and we are delighted to have them join, having been a member of CDSB's technical working group for more than five years. So CDSB is all about creating the enabling conditions for material climate change and environmental information to be integrated into mainstream reporting. Our mission is to advance and align the global mainstream corporate reporting model so that information about natural capital is reported with the same rigor as financial information. The outcome we seek is that information about natural capital and climate change delivered through mainstream channels leads to decisions and actions in support of a more sustainable and resilient economic system. So if I now turn to our next slide on the CDSB framework, we aim to achieve these outcomes by offering a framework for environmental and natural capital reporting. Our CDSB framework draws on reporting practices that align with and support our mission. This includes relevant financial reporting standards, mandatory reporting requirements, and voluntary frameworks, including the TCFD, that support climate and environmental reporting. Our framework also draws on and supports the work of our nine board member organizations. So what does the framework do? It sets out an approach to reporting climate and environmental information in mainstream reports. Information to be included is to be material that is material to the understanding of a company's financial risks and opportunities and the resilience of its business model. This framework builds on the 2010 CDSB Climate Change Reporting Framework, which focused specifically on risks and opportunities that climate change presents to an organization's strategy, financial performance, and value. We have expanded the um, Frame, the climate change reporting framework in, in 2010 based on four corporate reporting developments. We saw that um, mandatory reporting of environmental information in, was increasing in some jurisdictions. We also saw increased recognition by organizations of the risks associated with the use of natural resources. 
thirdly, we saw a demand for a more holistic approach to corporate reporting. And we also saw a recognition that environmental issues are more closely linked to climate change. So if I move on to the next slide, which is our objectives on, for the CDSB framework. So this is really what our framework aims to do, how it aims to help. So we have seven objectives to align financial reporting objectives, to standardize material environmental reporting, to present and prepare material environmental information with the same rigor as financial information. We want to add value to the mainstream report through the CDSB framework by promoting simplification and minimizing reporting burdens. And we want to enable investor decision making on the allocation of financial capital, as Nancy said earlier, to activities supporting long-term e environmental and economic resilience. And we want to support regulatory compliance and assurance and verification activities. So if I just turn back to that first objective, which is fundamental to CDSB's work, our framework offers company a meet companies the mean of reporting means of reporting climate and environmental information with the same rigor as financial information. So we do this through the vehicle of the mainstream report. And for, for those of you who are not familiar with this terminology, what I mean by the mainstream report is it could be the annual report, it could be an integrated report, Form 10K, 20F, or in a European context it might be referred to as the management report. And the TCFD uses the term annual financial filings, but we're all basically talking about the same thing. So mainstream reports are those annual reporting packages in which organizations are required to deliver their audited financial results under compliance, corporate or securities law in the jurisdictions that they operate. So this information is in the public domain and it provides information to investors about the financial performance or position of the reporting entity. They generally contain financial statements, governance, disclosures, management commentary and other information. So if we move on to the next slide, this just sort of summarizes what, um, how our framework works. So we have seven guiding principles and 12 reporting requirements. And we updated our, t our framework in tw April 2018 to align with the, the TCFD recommendations following the publication of the TCFD report in June 2017. So if we look at um, our framework at a glance, um, just to give you an idea, we have 374 users of the CDSB framework from around the globe. So this includes 32 countries and 10 sectors. They, our users range from Coca-Cola to Airbus to Danone, Samsung, and many others. And on the next slide, this um, sort of our global map sort of gives you an indication of, of our outreach. We are also referenced in stock exchanges and reporting requirements in London, Australia, New York, Singapore, and elsewhere. So if I just want to sort of highlight how our, our, our framework is, is, is structured in the next slide. So and we have um, an introduction which sets out the purpose, objectives, intended users, audience, and practical information. And really the heart of our framework is our principles and requirements. So our framework is aimed at companies or corporate groups as users of the framework. Investors are the audience as the primary users of mainstream reports. The idea of the framework is that you use the hard work you've done to prepare your environmental reporting and disclosures to CDP, GRI, and others for reporting in your annual report. You might be reporting to comply with legislation, to prepare for integrated reporting, or to share environmental and climate related information with your shareholders alongside your financial information. The idea is to display this material environmental information in your annual report. So, our framework principles guide you on how to report environment and climate information, and our requirements set out what you need to report. Key to all of this is bridging financial and non-financial information. So if we move on to the next slide, which provides a summary of our seven guiding principles. So we offer guidance on how to report by offering these seven principles. Collectively, they help to ensure that climate-related and environmental information is correct, complete and decision useful for investors. So we apply these seven principles in determining, preparing and presenting environmental information in the mainstream report. So the principles relate to relevance, materiality, faithful representation, connected, um, having disclosures connected with information in the mainstream report, ensuring that disclosures must be consistent, comparable, 
clear and understandable, verifiable, and also forward-looking, which should be very familiar when thinking about the TCFD. So our, if we take a principle four, it states that disclosures must be consistent and comparable. Consistency and comparability is at the core of what CDSB does. We've included this principle to help ensure that investors can elicit information of value from the annual report in a way that is consistent and comparable between similar organizations reporting periods and sectors. So if we move on to the next slide, which covers our requirements, that is, what is to be reported? So these 12 requirements are the highest common denominators of, ex of what existing reporting standards, guidelines, and frameworks are already prescribing. There are high-level requirements that help you find the right information in your existing disclosures to include in your mainstream report. If we look a little closer at requirement two, the disclosures um, related to reporting management's environmental po policies, strategies, and targets as an example. We then go on to specify what information must be included under each of these three aspects. For example, disclosures on environmental policies should state the rationale for and nature of these policies and strategies. They should also explain whether they involve reductions, efficiencies, and diversification. Similarly, key stakeholder relationships and perspectives, advocacy memberships, and related policy engagement, as well as work with suppliers and other third parties would also be disclosed under this requirement. If we consider reporting on the target aspect, Targets should state a timeline and describe the environment and climate related impacts for the short, medium, and long term horizons that also have a material financial impact on the organization. This requirement also offers guidance on criteria for selecting useful key performance indicators to measure progress against the target. So, if I move on to the, the, the next part of the presentation, which is basically looking at CDSB's framework alignment with the TCFD. So to recap what has been said at the beginning, the task force remit was to help companies better understand what financial markets need from disclosure to effectively measure and manage climate risks and opportunities. There are significant and not surprising parallels between TCSD and the CDSB framework. In fact, we are the only framework to be referenced by the TCSD for all 11 of its recommended disclosures. So our alignment comes in a number of areas. We are aligned in terms of the channels of disclosure, i.e. through the vehicle of the mainstream report, of our intended audience, that is investors, who can make capital allocations needed in support of environmental and climate resilient economies. We have also provided additional information in our updated CDSB framework on risk management and scenario analysis. For example, on scenario analysis, we suggest that all organizations consider applying a basic level of a scenario analysis for strategic planning. This could include forming a narrative that bridges the organization's vision of a possible future and how their business model would be resilient to emerging material risks and could also seize opportunities arising. We will also be publishing a short paper on scenario analysis next month. We have also shared have a shared view of the inclusion of material information in the mainstream report. And we have a shared focus on linking financial and non-financial information. We are not only interested in the impact of the business on the environment, but also how the environment and climate impact on the business. Finally, we share an emphasis on forward-looking information in considering both risks and opportunities. Earlier this year, we aligned our framework to the TCFD, and in particular, we signpost to six of our key requirements for use in making disclosures under the four core TCFD elements, and these are clearly marked. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see this alignment a little bit more closely. So on the on the left hand on the left hand side, you'll see are the TCFD principles. And then on the right hand side are the CDSB principles. So obviously materiality and relevance are, are, are the same, consistent and comparable are the same, variable is, uh, verifiable is the same. So, so there's an obvious alignment between the TCFD principles and the CDSB principles. This is also um, illustrated in a, in a separate way when looking at the requirements as well. So if we move to the next slide, you will see a summary of the alignment from the, from the framework to the actual 11 recommended disclosures, and those are the ones in color across, across the top.
So if we decide to look at alignment a little bit further, we can look at the linkages between CDSB, SASB, T and TCSD. The next slide is um, drawn from the appendix to our framework, and I appreciate it's not um, not difficult, a little bit just challenging to see on the on the um, webinar, but it shows an alignment across a number of different reporting frameworks, including the TCFD and also our earlier climate change reporting reporting framework and how how these different reporting frameworks of the landscape fits together. So if we identify some areas for, for, for common ground, so moving on from the connections from the broader corporate reporting landscape, on this next slide, I would like to highlight three key areas or takeaways where CDSB, SASB, and TCFD share common ground. The first relates to financial materiality. All three frameworks emphasize climate-related impacts on the company's financial condition or operating performance. They're all aimed at harmonization and simplification. We are all aimed at leveraging, not creating new disclosure re regimes. And as I have emphasized at the beginning of this webinar, they all advocate for inclusion of material information in the mainstream report. This allows for linkages of financial and climate-related information and equating them both with the same level of rigor. At the end of this webinar, David and I will share some additional resources, including two joint papers by CDSB and SASB related to alignment on, on TCFD. So if we move on to the next slide, which contains a diagram of the connections in the reporting landscape. So if we see TCFD as the catalyst for the financial community discussing climate risk, then we can look at the relationship between C CDP, SASB, and CDSB. CDP helps companies collect information in a structured way. SASB helps establish what is material and which metrics to use. And then CDSB offers guidance on how to report this material information in the mainstream report. Now, obviously, there are not, this is not a full overview of, of what each organization does, but then there are other reporting standards and organizations that could be included. So if we look at the TCFD, CDSB, SASB alignment a little bit further, we have a similar table in the CDSB framework that shows a specific alignment between the three. And you will see further areas of common ground here. Again, for example, we say that all disclosures should be verifiable. So I'd just like to move on to um, what, we've, what we've been learning so far in terms of corporate responses to the TCFD in terms of implementation. Now, the next slide, Nancy um, also um, flagged this earlier about the, in the, at the beginning of the webinar about the implementation pathway. So I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the TCFD five-year implementation path. And just to point out that we are really in the first year of reporting, and the second year on this pathway refers to companies reporting under other frameworks to implement the TCFD recommendations. So they would include our framework as well as others, and considering climate change-related issues in their business. So really, we're at the um, companies are at the beginning of a, of a journey. So on the next slide is, um, is is about are companies ready or prepared for the TCFD? So we're seeing that there's a growing body of analysis this year of corporate disclosures on climate risks and opportunities under the TCFD umbrella. At the beginning of this year, CDSB and CDP produced the Ready or Not report, which looked at corporate preparedness or readiness for the TCFD. This was based on CD CDP disclosures in the company responses to the 2017 CDP questionnaire. And it was found that there were a number of elements of the TCFD that were already being disclosed by companies but that these need to move into the mainstream report. We also should point out that the CDP questionnaire has now been fully aligned to the TCFD recommended disclosures. So then the next, um, the next slide um, I'd like to, to sh um, share with is we, tomorrow in Brussels, CD CDSB and CDP are launching our first step reports of corporate climate and environmental disclosures under the EU non-financial reporting directive. This report um, looks at the top 80 companies by market capitalization across Euro Europe to see how companies were making disclosures of environmental information under the EU Non-Financial Reporting Directive, or EU, it's commonly known as the EU Non-Financial Information Directive. So we wanted to identify opportunities for incorporating certain aspects of the TCFD recommendations into the directive and its non-binding guidelines. We wanted to see if reporting practices could serve both sets of requirements and could be consolidated. 
Overall, we found differences in disclosures of environmental and climate information. For example, of these 80 companies, 70% disclosed environmental or sustainability policies in their mainstream report, compared to only 20% on climate policies. That said, we also found it is possible for companies to make first steps at implementing the TCFD recommendations as they consider their disclosure obligations under the Non-Financial Reporting Directive. Of the 80 companies reviewed, company reports reviewed, 30 or 38% made some mention of the TCFD. It's at this early stage that we recognize that first steps may or may not include the actual disclosures. For example, we now know that some companies are getting their house in order and undertaking internal or external reviews. And anyone who is interested, the, um, the report will be launched tomorrow, but it is available on cdsb.net forward slash NFR review. So now, as, as, I, as I come to the end of, um, end of the, the presentation, I'd just like to draw your attention to some practical tools that um, are available and um, additional forms of support. So the next, uh, the next slide is a TCFD recommendations checklist. And CDP has developed this checklist to help companies as they begin their, TC, their TCFD journey. It includes a number of practical steps that companies could take, and I won't go into detail to all of them right now, but it aims from getting feedback from investors and bringing together different parts of the business to, to agree roles. On the next slide is a screenshot of the TCFD Knowledge Hub. The so CDSB, in collaboration with the TCFD Secretariat, has developed and continued to manage and develop the TCFD Knowledge Hub. This is an absolutely fantastic resource which brings together all the resources in one spot and categorizes them under the four TCFD pillars. We have also recently added a case study page to the Knowledge Hub. So if you have useful resources to share, please um, do, con do add them to the TCFD Knowledge Hub using the contribu contribute button on the web page. So coming to the, the, the end, I also wanted to finally flag that CDSB and its partner organizations are working with a group of 20 committed companies to implement the TCFD as far as fully practical, practicable within three years. So for more on the TCFD commitment, please um, refer to our website. And um, without, um, and so that is, is a whistle stop tour of the CDSB framework and our alignment to both TCSD and SASE. And I'm now delighted to, to hand back over to, to, to Nancy to introduce David, our partner from SASE. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nadine. That was uh, a lot of great information. So appreciate you walking us through everything that you're doing. Um, before I pass along to Daisy, we got a couple of specific questions directed at you. So I wondered maybe if we could just take a couple moments and, and cover those. One was um, uh, about whether CDSB was created to support TCFD or the latter. Okay, or, or so that's that, completely that different. <laughs> So early, um, in April this year, um, we celebrated our, our 10 year anniversary of, of, of CDSB. And the, so CDSB was actually created to do, to do precisely what the TCFD has done. And the great thing about the TCFD is it has given an uplift to, to, to our work to ensure that um, disclosure of climate risks and opportunities and also in, in environment and natural capital information is integrated into mainstream reports and that we end up getting decision useful information available to investors to inform their allocation of, of capital. So it's um, the parallels between TCFD and the CDSB framework are very, very close and, 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 we're, and it's really brought our work into the mainstream globally. Great, and, and that was another question um, that came up was whether or not these were global standards or if there are specific standards. I know you mentioned a bit about the EU. Um, if you could speak a bit to, to how this is relevant to various jurisdictions around the world. So the CDSB framework has universal applicability and um, obviously um, if there are 
national it, it it applies across jurisdictions but where and tries to align to, to to what needs to be done nationally as well under a national regulation and, and and law so it's universally applicable the um comments that i made about the eu um, non-financial reporting directive um also apply because the eu is in the process of um undertaking a review of the directive and the accompanying guidelines. So there's an opportunity to look at um, integrating, better integrating the TCFD, which currently in the guidelines says that, the, the, um, that it takes into account the work of the TCFD, but there's a real opportunity to, to influence that, that right now as the directive is being reviewed and its underlying guidance has be, be, is being reviewed. Great. Thanks, Nadine. And I have some other broader questions that I think I'm going to save for, for the end after David's presentation. So thanks again, Nadine, for answering some of those questions and walking us through. And, uh, and now I'd like to kind of pass the baton over to David Parham, who's Deputy Director of Research at SASB, to give us um, some background about what they've been working on and doing and how it kind of connects with what CDSB is doing as well. David? Fantastic. Thank you, Nancy, and really appreciate the opportunity to join the webinar. And uh, thanks to Nadine for the terrific overview of CDSB. I hope to briefly walk through how the SASB standards can uh, help companies effectively implement the TCFD's recommendations uh, for making the recommended disclosures. And uh, at the end, kind of tie everything together, bringing uh, the elements that uh, Nadine described so well related to the CDSB's framework, as well as the, the SASB standards into how companies can combine this um, to build a, a really effective uh, set of tools to enable uh, their disclosures related to the TCFD's recommendations. So on the next slide, I'll just start off with providing a brief overview uh, and level setting around who SASB is as an organization. Uh, we're a nonprofit based in uh, San Francisco, California, and our mission is to create industry-specific sustainability accounting standards that help companies disclose financially material decision useful environmental, social, and governance information to investors in a cost effective way. Uh, on the next slide, to, to focus in on what we mean by, by that mission statement, um, we're, the SASB standards are intended to communicate uh, ESG performance factors that are reasonably likely to affect the financial condition or operating performance of companies within an industry. And that's what we mean by looking at uh, financially material issues uh, in the sustainability landscape. So in the process of preparing our industry-specific standards, we assess different types of sustainability issues uh, for materiality, looking at uh, evidence of investor interest in that issue related to their decision-making, as well as evidence of uh, financial impacts that have resulted uh, from uh, company exposure to or management of those sustainability issues. On the next slide, uh, you'll see how we envision the SASB standards being used in communication to investors. So just as financial accounting standards help standardize and present uh, financial reporting or financial performance information from companies to their investors, so the SASB standards are intended to help standardize um, financially relevant sustainability uh, performance information. And with the combination of these two sets of data in communications to investors, whether that be through regulatory filings, integrated reports, annual reports, or other communications, this really provides uh, investors with a complete set of information to help them understand the financial performance uh, of companies uh, in the industries for which they are uh, reviewing these disclosures. So on the next slide, uh, the, the key tenants that SASB takes into account in creating the standards are, are listed here. And it's as I said that the standards are intended to communicate financially material information, that such information is decision useful for investors and for company management teams, that it can be communicated and reported in a cost-effective way, that such information is industry-specific, taking into account the fact that different industries and their inherent business models have different types of exposures to sustainability-related issues, that we're evidence-based in the creation of the standards and that the standards reflect uh, stakeholder feedback from the market. And, and just to show a, a brief cartoon on the next slide of what a standard looks like, uh, there's really three key elements. Um, and these are the elements we'll be discussing later in the presentation as it relates to the TCFD's recommendations. 
The first element are the topics that I mentioned to you, which are the uh, topics in a given industry that are likely to be material. Could be topics like uh, greenhouse gas emissions or air quality or water management. And then associated with each of those topics, there'll be one or more uh, performance metrics, which are metrics that are intended to communicate uh, a company's performance um, related to that topic. Associated then with each metric, there is a technical protocol. That technical protocol details uh, the methodology for calculating and preparing the metric, and that's really critical to ensure the comparability of the, co of the data that companies are reporting, which is critical to ensuring the usefulness for investors who are looking to compare and benchmark performance within a given industry. So those are the three primary elements that make up a SASB standard. And as we start to turn to, to climate impacts, on the next slide, uh, here's the list of all the different issues that SASB evaluates for materiality in each industry standard. And they're broadly grouped under uh, the five areas you see here, environment, social capital, human capital, business model, and leadership and governance. And for each industry standard, we assess the materiality of each of the topics in each industry. Many of the items you see listed here directly relate to uh, climate-related risks or opportunities, things like greenhouse gas emissions, energy management, climate impacts, and, and many other issues. Uh, so each of those, as I said, are assessed for materiality. On the next slide, you'll see uh, where those, uh, which industries uh, uh, they've been assessed for materiality in. So each of the industries, the 77 different industries here has its own individual standard uh, with topics that are likely to be material to companies within that industry and associated uh, industry specific metrics that help facilitate disclosure on those topics. So on the next slide, we'll bring this all together here into a grid, which uh, along the top of the grid, uh, uh, shows uh, in each column the 77 different uh, industry standards. And uh, along the side of the grid, you have uh, the different SASB issues that I mentioned to you that were analyzed for uh, materiality in each of those industries. So you can observe there's a lot of uh, boxes here that are shaded in either green, blue, or gray. And those indicate topics that are likely to be material in a given industry um, for that industry. You'll notice that um, in green, we have topics that are related specifically to climate-related risks or opportunities. And in blue, those that are related to water, which can include elements of climate risk as it relates to uh, shifting weather patterns and water scarcity. So I think the important takeaway here is very similar to the TCFD's um, kind of foundational um, purpose in, in, in its work is that climate risk is ubiquitous across the economy and that uh, almost all of the industries shown here have some element of exposure to climate risk. But equally important is the fact that that risk manifests in very different ways depending on the, comp uh, the industry's business model and how that business model exposes it to potential risks arising from climate change. And that's where SASB is designed to help facilitate these industry-specific disclosures that help companies communicate those um, uh, industry-specific impacts uh, to their investors. So on the next slide, uh, that's exactly how the TCFD uh, positions SASB as an implementation tool uh, to help facilitate these effective disclosures uh, to investors. The TCFD's uh, recommendations uh, position SASB in this way, especially through their uh, implementation annex. And in the next set of slides, we'll explore exactly how the SASB standards can be used to facilitate these effective disclosures per the recommendations of the TCFD. So on the next slide, um, Nadine already explained uh, very effectively how there is a very great alignment between the TCFD, the CDSB, and SASB in terms of our, our common foundation and focus on materiality. And, uh, the, uh, the goal of facilitating effective disclosures uh, to investors through um, mainstream financial reports. Um, on the next slide, I'll, I'm I'll, I've shown here how specifically SASB helps support uh, the TCFD's recommendations and um, where we really fit in well is in the, the targets and metrics portion, specifically uh, as we observed in the matrix side previously, climate risk manifests in different ways depending on unique factors within each industry. So, of course, the exposure of an apparel company 
may be similar in some ways to that of an automobile, automobile manufacturing company, but also will be different in other ways. And the SASB standard can help companies by providing, providing standardized comparable metrics that are industry specific and can enhance the quality of disclosures made to investors per the TCFD's recommendations. In addition, the SASB standards and the associated topics and metrics help support the other aspects of the TCFD's disclosure recommendations related to governance, strategy, and risk management. Specifically, as we'll see later in the slide deck, qualitative company discussion around the oversight, strategy, and risk management uh, processes used to manage climate risk can be directly supported by the quantitative metric-based performance disclosed uh, using the, the help of the SASB standards. So together, this qualitative explanatory disclosure along with the quantitative performance data data can really help companies effectively communicate to investors regarding their management of climate risk and how such management translates into impact or results. Uh, so with that in mind, that's how the SASB standards directly report effective TCFD disclosure. However, there's of course some nuance in the details of how the SASB standards can be used as effective uh, tools for, for making TCFD related disclosures. And so to fully build out that picture, uh, I'll now dive a little more deeply into four areas where some additional considerations can be layered on top of the SASB standards to help fully meet the recommendations of the TCFD. And on the next slide, I've listed where those four areas are that we'll explore in some additional uh, detail. Um, basically, because climate risk exposure, of course, varies by industry, additional considerations may apply to companies in certain industries to meet the cross-sectoral recommendations of the TCFD. So those include uh, considerations related to the application of scenario analysis, the reporting of greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, additionally, for some industries where the SASB standard may not include uh, direct climate-specific topic or metrics. So we'll cover those situations in numbers one through three. In addition, uh, number four relates to the TCFD's implementation guidance, uh, which includes certain additional factors that companies in financial and non-financial industries uh, should consider. Uh, in those industries, the SASB standards do provide a, a strong foundation upon which to build out those additional disclosures provided in the supplemental guidance. And so we'll dive into that as well to see how, what that looks like and provide a very specific example of how that works. So on the next slide, uh, I've highlighted here, we're going to take a look first at scenario analysis. Um, the TCFD recommends that where material, of course, companies disclose information related to the resilience of a company's strategy, taking into consideration different climate-related scenarios, including a two-degree or lower scenario. Um, in terms of the SASB standards, the SASB standards can help facilitate uh, these types of disclosures um, in uh, the industries for which we have directly included metrics related to scenario analysis. Those metrics are typically included uh, in industry standards where, uh, of course, climate-related risks are likely to be material, and where metrics related to scenario analysis uh, were determined as uh, specifically useful, comparable, representative, and applicable, which are criteria that SASB adheres to in the development of our standards. So based on this approach, you can find disclosure that takes into account elements of scenario analysis in the 12 industries listed on the right-hand side of the slide. Metrics in each of these industries range from, range from qualitative disclosure of the scenarios applied and the use of, those, uh, of the application of those scenarios to guide company strategy and risk management of specific topics in the standard, for example, managing access to natural resources, risks in the supply chain, or strategic decisions related to product development. Other metrics include more robust quantitative disclosure related to the application of reference scenarios, for example, those in the coal operations and oil and gas exploration and production industry, which include specific metrics related to the application of reference scenarios, such as those in the International Energy Agency's World Energy Outlook. For companies in industries for which the SASB standard does not include a specific disclosure item related to scenario analysis and where such uh, disclosures are determined uh, as material by the company, uh, it's recommended that companies refer directly to the TCFD recommendation strategy disclosure element C. And in these cases, the SASB standard can be, a, can be quite helpful in providing climate-related disclosure topics and associated metrics and targets that the company can utilize in its forward-looking scenario analysis to help facilitate more effective disclosure to its investors. So for example, in many industry standards, there will be metrics related to uh, water access and a forward-looking uh, scenario analysis may take into account how this will change over time, 
how the company's risk management process and strategy is being developed to anticipate and react to those uh, changing conditions. So in the next slide, we'll look at a specific example in the oil and gas exploration and production industry. As I said, we have this metric related to the sensitivity of hydrocarbon reserves levels to uh, scenarios that include a price on carbon emissions. Our metric specifically recommends the application of the International Energy Agency's current policy scenario, new policy scenario, and sustainable development scenario. And the application of those reference scenarios is, is uh, helpful in that it allows for comparability between companies when you're looking at performance uh, due to the application of the same uh, input set of assumptions. However, our metric also recognizes uh, that uh, a company may uh, have additional scenarios that it, it views as uh, perhaps more accurate or more relevant or more informative to its investors. And as such, uh, the, uh, the metric also provides uh, the opportunity to, to disclose these additional scenarios. So here on, you see an example of what the outcome of that might look like. Uh, a few takeaways and in terms of the, the useful uh, nature of this information uh, relate to, for example, you can observe um, that in the application of the current policies, new policies, and sustainable development scenario, that this fictional company's oil reserves may be slightly more at risk uh, for not being producible under those scenarios, but you can observe that the company's gas resources are significantly more climate resilient. Then if we look at the company-specific scenarios, which, I, as I mentioned before, are intended to provide management views of scenarios that are perhaps more uh, accurate or useful, you'll observe that scenario A um, may correspond to what the company views as a business-as-usual scenario. You'll see that uh, for their uh, proved oil reserves, that there may be some small element of their reserves that are unproducible uh, under that scenario that they analyze, which could inform their forward strategy related to potentially um, selling those reserves or investing in technologies to enable them to be produced profitably in the future. And scenario B could be something like a worst case scenario, um, what, what could go wrong and how bad could it get scenario, which could allow the company to start thinking ahead about how, what signposts it might establish and how it might start to implement strategy and risk management processes to prevent that outcome from occurring. On the next slide, uh, we'll now jump into talking about uh, greenhouse gas emissions specifically. And on the next slide, uh, I describe here um, basically the, the TCFD's recommendations related to metrics and targets element D, recommend that organizations should provide their scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions and if appropriate scope three emissions and related risks where such information is material. Uh, it also notes that for organizations in the four non-financial groups that generate more than $1 billion in annual revenue should also consider disclosing this information. Uh, and lastly, it recommends that asset managers and asset owners report such information related to emissions associated with portfolio companies and climate-related reports to clients and beneficiaries. So practically, this, uh, these three provisions result in uh, recommended disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions across most industries, uh, primarily to meet needs of asset managers and asset owners who may need this information related to carbon footprinting um, of, it, of uh, an asset owner or manager's portfolio holdings. So to meet that demand, on the next slide, I briefly reviewed how the SASB standards address Scope 1, Scope 2, and Scope 3 emissions. Uh, scope 1 is fairly straightforward. We include uh, Scope 1 emissions as a recommended disclosure in 23 different industries. Um, for those, th those 23 industries, are those that account for the, the vast majority of direct greenhouse gas emissions. As such, for companies who are, whose industry standard may not include uh, a scope one emissions metric, they may need to make a supplemental disclosure uh, of such emissions based on asset manager or owner requests for such data. For scope two emissions, um, the SASB standards uh, do not directly uh, uh, recommend disclosure of scope two in the standards. Uh, rather, most of our metrics relate to a company's energy usage. Um, so uh, metrics related to energy management typically include the aggregate amount of energy consumed by the company, as well as uh, in many cases a breakdown uh, by the source of that energy, whether it's from uh, purchase from the grid, self-generated, whether it was sourced from uh, renewable or other sources. Uh, this approach was taken based on historical feedback that this was a particularly useful uh, method for investors to understand company strategies related to energy access. And this metric appears in 37 of the industry standards. So again, to the extent that scope two emissions may be requested um, 
by uh, asset owners or managers or other users of that information, um, companies can make supplemental disclosures to meet that requirement. And then for scope three emissions, the SASB standards currently do not include an explicit metric for such emissions. Uh, we do include metrics related to lifestyle impacts, life cycle impacts of products, where such considerations are likely material and provide decision useful information to investors. Um, so again, as, as noted above, to the extent that such information may be requested by uh, asset owners or managers, um, supplemental disclosures may be made. Uh, on the next slide, we'll talk about uh, where, what to do in the case of uh, where additional climate-related information um, may be helpful, um, especially in those industries for which the SASB standards may not contain uh, metrics or topics that directly relate to climate risk. So on the next slide, I've listed those industry standards, uh, which are nine of the total 77. Uh, and in these, there aren't uh, topics or metrics that directly relate to climate risk, such as greenhouse gas emissions, energy management, water management, physical climate risk factors, et cetera. However, the sustainability topics within these standards in many cases uh, may directly or indirectly be impacted by both broad or acute associated climate risks or opportunities. So as such, we recommend companies in these industries should directly refer to the TCFD recommendations and the CDSB framework when preparing their disclosures but may consider impacts resulting from its analysis of climate risk on the material SASB topics included in the industry standard. So for example, if one were to look at the professional and commercial services industry, companies may wish to consider how climate risk may impact, for example, their ability to effectively deploy their workforce to, make, to meet climate needs. Or in the biotechnology and pharmaceuticals industry, a company may wish to discuss how climate risk um, relates to its product pipeline, the siting of trials, impacts to pricing, or the ability to attract and maintain uh, employees in areas that may be impacted by uh, physical climate risk. Um, lastly, SASB is, of course, continuously monitoring climate-related impacts, and uh, we have many items of forward research related to, uh, as such issues emerge, um, the extent to which they may be included in future revisions of the standard. On the next slide, I'll jump into the last uh, uh, element that I wanted to, to discuss um, uh, on the webinar, and uh, that relates to this supplemental guidance um, ensuring that, uh, or demonstrating how the SASB standards can help uh, companies in those, uh, in those industries for which the TCFD provided supplemental guidance. On the next slide, I provided a table here. I won't go into it in detail. Um, it is included in a, a, a joint paper we did with the CDSB that uh, Nadine referred to earlier. Uh, that I'll refer to at the end of the presentation, but it essentially maps the uh, TCFD industry groups for which the supplemental guidance was uh, provided to the individual SASB industry standards. Um, so this can be helpful, and I would refer you to that report uh, to help see which standards might be applicable to you um, if you're looking at that supplemental guidance. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide, and you'll see that it covers uh, all the different uh, TCFD industry groups. On the next slide, we'll jump into an example of how this uh, can be used practically to facilitate disclosure. Uh, we'll look at the Energy Industry Group and the SASB Oil and Gas Exploration and Production Standard. So for this industry group, uh, we'll take a look at what the TCFD uh, supplementally recommends on top of its um, kind of cross-industry recommendations. For strategy, the TCFD recommends that companies consider discussing how climate-related risks and opportunities are integrated to their current decision-making and strategy formulation. And for metrics and targets, the TCFD recommends the use of metrics related to scenario analysis and strategic planning, as well as those related to greenhouse gas emissions, energy, water, land use, and uh, where relevant investments in climate adaptation or mitigation. So now we'll take a look at how the SASB standard uh, for this industry can help companies make these supplemental disclosures. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see for strategy, uh, the SASB standard for this industry includes two qualitative metrics that direct, directly relate to the TCFD's recommended disclosures, specifically how the company manages its own direct emissions, as well as how the company is managing its forward strategic plan related to capital allocation, uh, considering potential pressures on the value of its core hydrocarbon assets. For metrics and targets, the SASB standard contains a suite of metrics, including um, a company's direct emissions, uh, the, the types of uh, constituents in those emissions, specifically methane, the extent to which they are covered under emissions limiting regulations, uh, a breakdown of those emissions by various sources, which is important to understand mitigation strategies that companies will need to employ uh, to reduce or manage those emissions, 
uh, access to water, and finally, uh, the, uh, an analysis of how the company is allocating its forward capital, including the extent to which a company's reserves base may or may not be climate resilient relative to its peers, and the extent to which a company in this industry may be diversifying its business model to include lower carbon or uh, renewable energy sources. So this is an example of how the SASB's uh, suite of metrics can be used to help facilitate a more effective overall climate disclosure in line with the TCFD's recommendations by uh, providing management with KPIs to help demonstrate the effectiveness of their governance, strategy, and risk management related to these climate uh, industry-specific uh, climate-related risks or opportunities. So on the next slide, just to briefly review, uh, we've covered how the SASB standards can help facilitate effective disclosure uh, in alignment with the TCFD's recommendations. And we've also covered uh, what additional considerations companies may need to take into account to build out a highly robust set of uh, TCFD aligned disclosures. Uh, uh, as, as Nadine provided a great overview of the way in which the CDSB's framework can ensure the overall quality and effectiveness of such disclosures, uh, now we've seen how those can be uh, supported by the use of SASB with respect to industry-specific climate-relevant metrics and targets. So on the next slide, I'll try to bring this all together into a quick disclosure uh, example. So this represents uh, a mock disclosure format, um, kind of a cartoon of what this could look like related to um, the TCFD's recommendations. Uh, for the governance portion, as Nadine mentioned, the CDSB reporting requirements one and two directly support robust and effective disclosure related to governance of climate-related issues. And the inclusion of board oversight of performance as represented by applicable SASB metrics can also be included in helping investors understand um, the board oversight of climate-related uh, risks and opportunities. For strategy, the CDSB re reporting element requirements uh, two, three, and six, again, provide a set of tools to ensure the high quality uh, of disclosure, and SASB metrics can again be built into this discussion by connecting climate risk to specific channels of impact that companies may experience and enabling uh, effective description of how a company's strategy will identify, manage, and mitigate such industry-specific impacts. On the next slide, uh, we'll take a look at risk management. Um, CDSB provides a, a suite of reporting requirements noted here, uh, requirements one, two, three, and six. And this builds out a complete view of the company's process to identify, assess, and manage climate-related risks and opportunities. The company may then additionally utilize um, SASB's industry-specific uh, uh, climate-related topics and metrics to help build out and describe the types of impacts the company anticipates and to identify performance-related signposts that may trigger specific risk management responses. And finally, uh, with respect to metrics and targets, CDSB requirements two, four, and five related to metrics and targets, sources of impact, and performance and comparative analysis, supported by SASB's industry-specific metrics in capturing and communicating such impacts, can be used together to clearly and effectively communicate a company's performance to its investors. So on the next slide, uh, just to close, as a, as a reminder, the, the SASB standards uh, are, are an effective tool to help companies identify uh, effective and useful climate metrics to help communicate impacts to investors. Combined with the requirements of the CDSB's framework, such metrics can be highly effective communication tools to enable companies to demonstrate the, the value and robustness and uh, thoroughness of their governance, strategy, and risk, risk management processes. As such, we hope those on the call will find the CDSB framework and SASB standards a helpful platform upon which to build uh, highly effective and useful disclosures aligned with the TCFD's recommendations. And on the next slide, uh, which is the last slide, we have, um, uh, I think uh, Nadine and I could probably talk for hours about all the ways in which we hope and, uh, and believe that CDSB and SASB can be highly useful tools for companies seeking to implement the TCFD's recommendations, but since we don't have all day, <laughs> we wanted to point you to a few additional resources that folks on, on the call on the webinar may find helpful. Um, along the top row, first and foremost, uh, the SASB standard applicable uh, to your industry is, is uh, a helpful starting point uh, for potential climate risk factors and associated metrics to facilitate effective disclosure. Additionally, our, our Climate Risk Bulletin describes SASB's overall approach to assessing climate risk across all of our industry standards. And you'll notice it has uh, 
quite a lot of parallels to the TCFD's report, which really indicates our strong kind of shared foundation and approach to analyzing and assessing climate risk. Our implementation guide for companies is a helpful resource for companies who are new to the SASB standards and helps walk through how helps walk through how a company might go about reporting. I'll just note that we're actually in the process right now of significantly uh, revising and uh, updating this document based on feedback we have received. And there will be we do have plans to include a specific uh, supplement related to uh, implementing the TCFD's recommendations uh, in that document. And lastly, I'll mention the paper I alluded to earlier and that Nadine mentioned as well. Uh, our joint paper with the CDSB, Converging on Climate Risk, which really provides a great deep dive on how the CDSB and SASB are aligned and really uh, helps build out the picture of that foundation I described upon which uh, companies can uh, make effective TCFD disclosures using our frameworks. And now I'll, I'll pass it back to Nadine just to help walk us through the, the final four resources here um, and, and let her walk through those. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was great. We, the final one, obviously, um, the first one is um, the Ununcharted Waters paper, which is looking at certain international financial reporting standards and exploring how we can apply traditional financial instruments to help organizations re report about information on climate risks and opportunities in the mainstream report. The second one is, is, is obviously our framework. Uh, the third is another a similar paper to converging on, on, on climate risk that um, also outlines the, the linkages and how you move from principles to, to practice. And then the final paper is um, a position paper on materiality, and that really goes through what does the TCFD say about the application of materiality to financial disclosures, and it sort of outlines some of the challenges and solutions for making judgments on materiality. And all of these resources should also be available on the TCFD Knowledge Hub. Thank you so much, Nadine. And uh, so with that, that concludes the, the content that we had prepared for the webinar. So I'll pass it back to Nancy again. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present and look forward to any questions from the audience. Great. Thanks so much, David and Nadine. Um, lots of really great information. We've gotten some, some really good questions that have come through from the audience. I mean, one of the, the things that I think folks get a little confused about is that there are a lot of different um, frameworks and ways to report. And so one of the questions we got is why are there so many different yet similar frameworks and requirements and is there any work to try to consolidate some of these even more? You hear a lot about aligning frameworks, but is there any more work uh, being done to consolidate to create even greater consistency? Uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, Nadine, may, do you want to jump in on that and maybe I, I can support as well? Uh, sure. Um, I think that um, really to, to recognize that CDSB's framework it, um, was done through a participatory process and um, obviously engaged um, our technical working group heavily and the um, CDSB board members as well. So that's been a collaborative process with, with a lot of the, the key uh, um, reporting frameworks available. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is um, the corporate reporting dialogue. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the corporate reporting dialogue, it's an initiative that was convened in June 2014, and it's designed to respond to market calls for greater coherence, consistency, and comparability between corporate reporting frameworks, standards, and related requirements. So there's a number of participants in the CRD, including CDP, CDSB, SASB, and others. And um, just earlier this month um, at the Bloomberg Sustainable Business Summit in London and also at the World Congress of Accountants, um, there was an announcement and launch of the Better Alignment Project, which is um, sort of the ideal project to, re to respond um, to address this, this, this question about the multiple frameworks and ways to report. So what this this, this alignment project will do is it will focus on the alignment and linkages between the TCFD recommendations and those participants in the CRD that work in the ESG reporting space. So by that I mean CDSB, CDP, GRI, IIRC, and SASB. And what's going to happen under the Better Alignment Project over the, over the next year is that participants in the project will be mapping their frameworks and standards to the principles, disclosures, and metrics of the TCFD and um, as well as against one another for climate-related financial rep reporting issues. 
So the degree of alignment for each element of the TCFD recommendations in the various frameworks and, and standards will be classified. So out of that technical work and exercise, we um, will have a publication which will be showcasing our linkages and alignment level to the TCFD recommendations, which will be released later next year. So I hope that that will help to um, respond to, to, to that query about the multiple frameworks and, 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 and ways of reporting and, and to give some assurance that the Better Alignment Project hopes to address this. Thank you. I just realized I was on mute. Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a great answer to that question. Um, another question that came up is um, how many different companies are using these frameworks and um, how does the company actually go about deciding which framework is best fit for their organization? Is there any guidance on that? Sure. May, maybe I'll, I'll jump in first and then, and then pass over to, to Nadine. So, um, we, the, the SASB standards uh, were actually just launched uh, earlier this month in their final codified version. Um, so we're, we're looking forward and excited for um, companies to uh, hopefully see the value in the framework and begin to voluntarily adopt and, and use, use the framework. Um, there were several companies that uh, jumped out to uh, and uh, took an early position in using the SASB standards in their provisional phase. There's uh, I think somewhere around 30, maybe to 40 uh, companies who have started reporting using the standards. Uh, and some of the, the feedback we've heard in terms of what's helpful um, in terms of assessing the different frameworks out there is really understanding the information needs of the audience that you're seeking to speak to and making your disclosures. Um, and so the SASB standards are really designed to, to help facilitate effective disclosures to, uh, to investors directly. And uh, we've heard that the, the industry-specific approach, uh, the ability to communicate on financially material topics is helpful in um, uh, companies uh, tailoring communication specifically to their investors on the issues that um, investors are, are focused on uh, related to the ESG space and, and uh, specifically to climate. And of course, that's very well, uh, that was very well covered by, by Nadine in, in, in emphasizing the alignment between the TCFD uh, the CDSB and SASB in terms of our, our focus on communicating these risks uh, to investors as a specific audience group. And, and maybe I'll pause there and see if Nadine uh, wanted to add anything. Thank, thank you, David. I think that, that that's quite clear. And just to echo what you said, that um, obviously the CDSB framework has the, and I've mentioned this before in the webinar, um, is also geared at having decision useful information for investors, as is the TCFD. So they they complement each other. And and so while there may be multiple frameworks, it's it's it, they they do, they do fit together quite nicely. But it's really understanding um, who who the as David said the inf who are the information needs of of the different audience. So the SASB um, framework and metrics fit fit quite nicely with with, with CDSB and because of our universal applicability, the, it, it, it is open. So it, it's really for each, each um, reporting entity to decide um, which, which which framework to use, and also to use the um, intended audience as as a as a signpost for deciding which is most appropriate, and also what is the scope of their um, the thematic topics that they're that they're disclosing disclosing. So obviously, we're looking specifically at. Um, environment and climate under the, and the linkages to financial information under the CDSB framework. So it's a useful starting point. Great, thanks for that. Um, you know, speaking a bit about materiality, um, we received a question on when you're using these frameworks to report, are you only using the lens of materiality to report through? This actually came through, David, during your presentation when you were talking about strategy. So are you only talking about strategy as a company if you find that it's material in a climate-related um, way? Uh, that's a great question, and, and you know, really, it's uh, the the our, our position at SASB is we try to uh, our research is all geared towards trying to surface and facilitate effective disclosure around topics that are likely to be material in a given industry based on kind of common factors that companies within that industry are likely to face. That being said, really the, the, 
the the company is of course in the best position to assess what is material to it and to communicate to its stakeholders which are its investors those aspects of its strategy um, that are um, that contain material information that they want their uh, investors to be aware of so so really where SASB sits is as um, a tool to help facilitate more effective disclosures but the, that that tool is ultimately uh, owned and used by the company uh, based on the company's discretion about um, what they what their objectives are in, in communicating to their investors on what they see as the material risk factors to their business. So, so the standard is a helpful starting point. It helps standardize and increase the effectiveness of disclosure within a given industry by providing a common language to talk about performance. Um, but ultimately, the, the company and the management team knows their company best and, and they're in the best position to make the call about what is material and, and what ultimately they include in their discussion to their investors using the guidance of the SASB standards, the CDSB framework, and, and the TCFD's recommendations as a helpful starting point. Thanks, David. Nadine, did you have anything else to add on? Um, just to add that the CDSB framework makes a distinction between relevant information and material information, and um, that um, you, you would start by identifying uh, relevant environmental and, and climate related information and then you would actually re only report the material information that is based on, on that relevant information. So it would reflect fa factors specific to the reporting organization as David has said and also it reflect environmental and climate risk and opportunities to which all businesses are potentially exposed such as climate change and therefore are considered material for the purposes of our framework. Um, there was another question that came through around accountability. So you have all of these frameworks. Um, who is doing, is this part of the auditing process since these are being uh, developed in their annual reports or how is this information then uh, verified once it's been reported out using one of your frameworks? Uh, sure, I can I can speak to that um, uh, a little bit. Um, really, uh, you know, it, it, in terms of uh, when when aggregating and disclosing and uh, preparing this information, uh, SASB's view on, on um, this information is that you know it is intended to be communicated uh, to investors, and the the information included in the standard, um, based on our evidence, is you know likely to be material related to material financial impact. So. Um, the, the, the view would be that uh, the extent to which um, information, uh, the, the sorts of assurance that would occur for uh, information that is communicated to investors by a company should, should be considered by companies in, as, in, in applying that to the information that they're reporting uh, through the use of the SASB standards um, to, to meet the recommendations of the TCFD. Um, so that... That, that really will depend on uh, kind of the company's uh, view and its, uh, its, its own assurance processes around the information that it reports to its investors. Um, but as, as this would be reported uh, ideally in an, in an integrated report to an investor, um, that, that's what we would, uh, we would suggest. Great. Thanks, David. Um, Nadine, if you have any additional comments, I'll give you a chance to pipe in as well. I uh, just that um, we have a specific requirement on assurance in the um, CDSB framework that was that wasn't picked up in, in in the TCFD, and really the purpose is is to inform those who are reading the report um, to whether and how to what extent the environmental information has been uh, reported in the in the annual report has conform confirm, conforms with the CDSB framework, whether it's been assured or or, or, or verified by a third party. But that 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 is um, a unique requirement to the CDSB framework. Okay, great. That's helpful. Um, there was a, a very specific question that came in earlier. It was directed at CDSB, but uh, David, you might have some thoughts on it too. Um, there was a question as to whether you're working with the insurance or finance industry to convert environmental data under TCFD alignment um, to turn it into financial risk measured data. Okay, we have um, we have um, a, 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 a serious, have been engaging with um, a number of um, corporates um, from including from the um, finance financial sector on on TCFD through through webinars and also through our Beyond Disclosure program. 
to help sort of prepare and, and disclose for TCFD recommendations. So we do work with a, with across a broad suite suite of of, of, of companies and and including within in the insurance and financial sector. Yeah, and the only thing that I'll I'll add is you know the the, the SASB standard specific to the insurance industry does have um, specific metrics around. Um, kind of the, the company's exposure to certain types of environmental or uh, other um, impacts as well as uh, the incorporation of uh, the company's, uh, the incorporation of ESG factors into the company's um, investment process and, and management of its investments. Um, so, so some relevant information there as well. Great. Um, someone else was curious about the extent to which uh, TCFD recommendations might be picked up by private companies in addition to those that are publicly traded. Um, do you think there's a tipping point where uh, this will include companies across the board? Yeah, I, I'll just share a, a few insights um, from, from the SASB side in that um, we, we've actually had uh, quite a bit of interest in, in our standards from, from private companies just as as being useful tools to communicate, uh, you know, with their with their own private owners as well as as management tools to to help focus or or get an idea of what the material issues um, uh, could be within within the industry in which they operate, um, reflecting kind of the consensus research that we do and engaging with lots of different investors in the market. Um, so so we similarly, I think the TCFD's recommendations would be perfectly applicable to. Uh, to a private company in, in that management team being able to effectively kind of identify, manage, and, and uh, report risk to, uh, to their owners. Um, so so I, would, I would hope that it would be useful uh, even in, in a, a private, um, private company context. And the, the data points that we have suggest that, that some companies, um, a private companies, do find uh, these approaches helpful. Just to add to... Go ahead. Sorry, just to add to, to what David, David had said, that obviously the CDFB framework is, is open to all companies, um, private or, or listed, and I, I think that our principles and requirements are, um, are also form part of, of what would be good corporate governance practice. So if you, you, to have good corporate governance, you need, you need, you need to consider um, climate change risks and opportunities as part of that, regardless of whether you're a private, um, whether you're a private or a public company. Um, there was another question regarding the role of government in supporting industries and their disclosures. Do you all have any specific thoughts? I know you've been working um, with different organizations and entities. Um, Nadine, perhaps you can speak to that since I know you were chatting a bit about the EU directive. I, th I think it's um, probably a useful um, point to start on that is, is to recognize that the TCFD was conceived as a voluntary market-based initiative, but we have lots of signs that regulators are picking up its regulations. So um, we know that um, regulators are consulting on this. We've seen this with the Canadian security administrators. We've seen it in Australia. And it's really, um, a, the time now is to start thinking about it. It's because we think it's not a matter of if, but actually when um, mandatory disclosure comes in. So we have um, we have mandatory disclosure across a number of multiple jurisdictions already. China, France, and EU have already mandated mandated disclosure, and we um, anticipate that others are likely to follow suit. Great, thank you. Um, lastly, we had um, some questions on. I have to find out. Sorry, I'm like flipping through all of my questions here at the end. But um, there was a, um, I can't even find it now. But there was one on how you would work um, advice for companies wanting to share more information with um, their climate disclosures. I'm sorry, this doesn't even make sense. Um, how I'm asking it anyway. What specific advice or consideration can you share for investors integrating climate disclosures into engagement strategies and proxy voting? There you go. Uh, sure, maybe I can I can start. That's definitely a, a, a 
<laughs> it's a it's a good question. Um, I think uh, I think what we've seen in the investment community is um, uh, you know a, a a real focus on um, trying to identify the material issues that that really matter um, within a given industry and and to engage um, effectively with companies to understand uh, how those company management teams are are looking at those issues and how they're managing performance along those issues. So. I think uh, the TCFD and, and CDSB and SASB are all aligned around that concept of materiality and really trying to focus in on those those factors that really drive performance within a given industry. And of course, uh, climate is a is a major focus area. Um, and I, I think the hopefully the value that that SASB can bring in, in adding to the conversation is helping to understand some of the industry specific ways in which climate risk uh, can impact companies within a given industry and help facilitate a really effective um, dialogue between investors and company management teams around the specific ways that companies in a given industry are managing the types of risks uh, that are uh, you know applicable or relevant to to those companies. Um, so that's where uh, you know we're hopeful that the the SASB standards will be a helpful tool in helping to build out that uh, that 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 language or that dialogue um, or that common set of of factors that can help enhance the, the quality and effectiveness of communication um, and engagement on these on these issues. Thanks, David. Um, Nadine, any specific thoughts on that that uh, question? Just to say that um, we, we would hope that um, by by um, undertaking disclosures through 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 our framework aligned to TCFD and in using the SASB metrics, that we will generate decision useful information that can then be used to, as part of those engagement activities and and for further dialogue. Great, thank you. Um, well, with that, we're getting close to the end of our time. I just want to take a moment and thank Nadine and David again for um, sharing. Uh, what they do with us today and a bit more about these frameworks that they've developed for folks. Um, I've gotten several questions via the webinar about the slides. Um, the presentation will be posted following this in the next day or two, so check back to our website for that or feel free to, to send me an email um, directly if you have any specific questions about the presentation. Um, my email is at the bottom of the slide here. So um, thanks again, and we hope you tune in again to one of our webinars here at C2ES. Take care and have a great day, everyone.